So we're going to actually start applying uh, the universal gravitation equation to something more practical like orbits. Uh, so we're going to start off with the International Space Station, which um, if I were to draw uh, an Earth for you, E for Earth, and then I were to draw a space station out here, um, you know, it's a stick with some solar panels, not to scale. Uh, that thing is orbiting approximately 431 kilometers above the surface. Okay, so we're going to start off by doing the uh, force of gravity acting on that space station at that particular place, um, which we've already done, um, but we'll see it again because I need it up here in order to do the rest of the work. So we're going to need our centripetal force calculation. No, we're not. We're going to need our gravitational force equation, which is g mass of object 1 mass of object 2 divided by radius squared. At that particular location, the radius that this station is orbiting at is the radius of the Earth plus 431 kilometers which is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters for the radius of the Earth and 4.31 times 10 to the uh, hundreds of kilometers would be 10 to the 5 which gives us a total of 6.7 uh, 3 and 4 is 7, 8, that would be 6.8 I'm just going to put this in the calculator so I don't make a mess of this. 6.38 times 10 to the 6 plus 4.31 times 10 to the 5 gives me 6.811 times 10 to the 6. Alright, so you notice that even at hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the Earth, I'm only adding an extra 10% or so to this distance. Um, so <laughs> to scale, if that's the Earth and I cut that into 10 bits you can see how wide each of those bits are. The orbit of the International Space Station compared to the size of the Earth is only about here. Which is kind of neat if you think about it. <laughs> like that to scale. Um, these things that feel very high above the surface, if you zoom out, are really quite local. Anyway, uh, moving on with this, uh, I've got a force of gravity up there, and of course I can fill in my universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Mass of the gravitating body would be 5.98 times 10 to the 24. And I'm going to leave the mass of the space station um, just unknown for the moment. So I'm going to get a force um, per kilogram. Just worked out that radius was 6.811 times 10 to the 6 squared. So getting my calculator. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 multiplied by 5.98 times 10 to the 24 gives me that 3.98866 times 10 to the 14 we keep getting divided by 6.811 times 10 to the 6 and we'll do it again 6.811 times 10 to the 6 because it's squared and I get 8 Point five nine eight m. All right. So that ends up being eight point five nine eight newtons per kilogram. And if I were to work that out as an acceleration, because that's really all I'm I'm worried about, right? Like, where, where is the space station going? Uh, if I set that up as net force is mass times acceleration that goes in for my net force m equals ma 
Well, these masses go away, and I end up with an acceleration of 8.598 meters per second squared. So, if I put that space station up there, and just let it hang out, it's going to experience an acceleration of almost 9 meters per second squared back towards the surface of the Earth, which is a problem. Uh, it was very expensive to put up there, um, and now it's just going to fall down like everything does in a gravitational well. So how do you end up being able to keep that thing uh, up there without having it fall back down to Earth? Well, I sort of gave it away up there. And when we start talking about orbits, that station isn't just up in the air, hanging over one place because gravity doesn't exist. It's up there zipping around the planet um, quite quickly so that the net force is not just gravitational. The net force ends up being gravitational and a centripetal force term that is counteracting Earth's gravity. So how big of a centripetal force um, does it take to keep a thing up there? Well, um, just sort of the basic idea here, if this ex space station is experiencing gravity that way, then I'm going to need a centripetal force of equal size in the opposite direction in order to make this thing um, stay at the same height. Alright, so if the centripetal force has to match the gravitational force, and centripetal force is mv squared divided by your radius, and the gravity force I just worked out was 8.598 per kilogram, you notice that immediately my masses divide out. Well, I know the radius this thing is orbiting at. I have that number here. The only thing I don't have is the speed, so I might as well work that out. Uh, so v squared is 8.598. The m's divided out, multiplied by this radius if I pop it up to the other side is 6.811 times 10 to the 6. All right. So v squared would be that number times 0.811 times 10 to the 6, which is 58.56203.2.01. Um, that is v squared, though, fortunately. Um, so I'm going to square root that to get my answer, and I get 7,652.58 meters per second. Neat. <laughs> uh, so that's that's uh, 7.6 kilometers per second. That's very fast. Um, the speed of sound in, in air is 343 meters per second. So if I just divide this by 343, just for scale, that's um, 22 times the speed of sound. Smiley face for that one. So the idea is that if you can get this object up there, and then you can get it traveling at 7.6 kilometers per second in a circle, then it will stay at the same height. It doesn't stay still, because right, it, is, it is moving quite quickly, but it's moving in a circular fashion. And the idea is, if I were to draw a really sort of lame sketch for you, the idea is that, that this station, right, if it's that far above the Earth, and you let it go this way at some ridiculous velocity, 7.6 kilometers per second, it will have fallen some in that time, but it's also lifted. And you see as this thing is tangential, there's this, this gap here. So even though it is technically falling under gravity. It is also rising off the surface due to traveling on a tangent uh, above a curved surface. So this, at a certain speed, at a certain precise speed, 
the amount of fall happens to match the amount of lift, and so net, you don't observe any. This thing travels along at 431 kilometers above the surface, which is really neat. Uh, so you can get something up there, and you can keep it there, as long as you can achieve these kinds of velocities. All right, so the, the question um, I suppose you should ask yourself then is how much energy does that cost? Because now we're not only lifting the object, but we also have to get it going at this particular speed. So I'm going to clean this off and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so to get a satellite up in the air and get it going at the, an orbit at the same height as the International Space Station, there's two things you have to do. First, you have to lift it. Then you have to get it going. So the lift energy, right, a delta E, would be the gravitational energy at the end. Subtract the gravitational energy at the start. So delta E would be uh, G M M over R at the end. That's negative. Subtract negative G M M R at the start. I have G, M, M in both of those terms, so I can factor them out. G, M, M. That leaves a negative uh, 1 over R at the end and a negative negative 1 over R at the start. So negative negative is a positive. And the starting radius is the Earth's radius, so I'll put that in there. Subtract 1 over this orbit height, radius of the orbit. Okay, so if I fill that in, I will have 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 multiplied by Earth's mass multiplied by 1 over 6.38 times 10 to the 6 subtract 1 over 6.88 or 6.811 times 10 to the 6. You can see I have <laughs> run out of my column space. That's what erasers are for later. All right, so uh, 1 divided by 6.38 times 10 to the 6 gives me something times 10 to the negative 7. Subtract 1 divided by 6.811 times 10 to the 6 gives me something times 10 to the negative 9 multiplied by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 gives me something times 10 to the negative 19 multiplied by 5.98 times 10 to the 24 which gives me 35 or 3956149 point eight M. Is that M we haven't filled anything in for yet? That means I need to spend, uh, let's see, metric prefixes, 3.96 megajoules per kilogram in order to lift that object up to the height I want it to orbit at. Just erase this line, this doesn't take up too much space. So that's not enough though. I have to get this particular uh, satellite in motion at a speed like this. So that's going to require some kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So my kinetic energy would be one half the mass of the thing, which I'm gonna leave in general so I can end up with another number, um, joules per kilogram. And the speed is 7,652.58 meters per second squared because the speed has to be squared all right so 7652.58 squared is and then cut in half gives me 292809909.33 m so that thing using metric prefixes is 29.28 megajoules 
per kilogram. All right. So to get something going at that particular orbit, um, it takes almost 30 megajoules per kilogram to get that done. Well, if you compare it to this, right, <laughs> lifting something up in the air that high is hard, um, but it's only, what is this, almost four and this is almost 30. So it's seven and a half times more energy to get the thing going than it is to get it up there in the first place. So if you consider these two things um, and you watch a shuttle launch, if you uh, ever look at them, the, uh, the space shuttles, right, the ones from the 80s and the 90s, um, were a massive booster. And then they had the shuttle sort of strapped onto them here. And it looked pretty tiny compared to the booster. Now, if you put something on the side of an object and then you put it up in the air, this has has set the thing off of its uh, center of mass. So it's going to tip this way. It's going to try and fall over. Which means that as this thing takes off, instead of going straight up, it's going to follow a path that leans backwards like so. And the idea is that as it bends backwards, right, the thing leaves your, your planet, falls backwards, and then achieves that speed so that it can complete a nice circular orbit and then once it's up there because it's achieved the correct speed off it goes it stays up there for uh, as long as this orbit remains stable so that's kind of neat um, just being able to calculate how much energy is required so we're just going to try a, a simplification of this uh, particular equation I need some board space first though So the idea behind an orbit was that when I have something up there, it is experiencing gravity from the object that it is orbiting, whether it's a moon or a planet or the sun or whatever, but that that force of gravity is balanced by the tendency of the object to fly off of its circular path. Force of gravity is calculated by doing the universal gravitational constant, the mass of the orbiting body, the mass of the craft in orbit divided by the radius um, from the center of that planet squared. Centripetal force is uh, the mass of the orbiting object, the speed at which it's traveling squared divided by the radius. So immediately you can see that the mass of the object is irrelevant. So that divides out. I'm going to be able to pop this radius up here. So I end up with G M equals V squared R squared over R. And one of these R's down here divides out an R up there, leaving this particular thing. So that's that's the basics of of orbital mechanics, if I take the, this idea and then divide out anything that's irrelevant, I end up with that number. Now speed is sometimes a tricky thing to calculate, um, so if you were to take speed and remember that speed is distance over time, and that this object is traveling on a circle, every so often. I'm going to take this particular expression and I'm going to park it in for the speed. So I get gm equals 2 pi r over t multiplied by r and this thing is squared because the speed is squared gives me 2 squared is 4 pi squared is pi squared, r squared is r squared multiplied by another r gives me r cubed, and t squared in the denominator, I end up with that thing. This little expression here is known as Kepler's law. And it combines the radius of your orbit and the period of your orbit, so that's how much time it takes to complete one full rotation, with g 
which is a universal constant, and m, which is the mass of the uh, gravitating body. Now, sometimes you see the 4 pi squared over on that side, um, so it would look like, like this, g m over 4 pi squared is 4 cubed, sorry, r cubed over g squared. Now, a physicist or a mathematician loves an expression like that uh, because g is a constant, m is a constant. 4 and pi squared are constants. These two things, radius and time squared, raised cube and time squared, are supposed to be variables, but they are locked in a ratio determined by the fundamental nature of the universe and the mass of the gravitating object. So you can cook up any radius you'd like to orbit at, and there is a predetermined orbital period that will get it done around the object you're trying to orbit vice versa, if there's a certain time that you want to have the orbit locked at, then there is a radius where that will happen. So we did this uh, International Space Station example, so I'm going to give it a try. I want to find out how much time it takes for that station to complete one orbit. Uh, so in order to do that, I have to fill in my universal gravitation constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, the mass of the Earth, 10 to the 24, 4 pi squared goes down here. The radius of the orbit is 6.811 times 10 to the 6 cubed, and I've got t squared down here. So t squared is going to come up, 4 pi squared is going to come up. And these numbers are going to end up in the denominator. Okay, so if I were to calculate t squared, let's see, pi squared is 9.869 times 4, it's 39 point something, multiplied by 6.811 times 10 to the 6 some brackets there. Cubed gives me 1.247 times 10 to the 22 divided by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 gives me something to the 32 divided by 5.98 times 10 to the 24 gives me this ridiculous number. 312 Seven two six nine eight point six three. Now that is time squared, so I need to square root to get my final answer. And I get five thousand five hundred ninety two point one two if I round. Now let's be very careful about what we put in here. This time right came from this expression here which came from a speed that was coordinated to work in meters per second that means that this orbital period is 5592.12 seconds which is sort of meaningless so i'm going to convert it to minutes and i get 93.2 And if I convert that into hours by dividing by 60 again, I get 1.553. So, at the speed required to keep this International Space Station up at 431 kilometers above the surface, right, at 7,652 meters per second, this station completes a full circle of the planet once every one and a half hours. So <laughs> that's bonkers. Um, but if you are uh, lying on your deck or on, in a field at night um, on, a, on a good clear evening and you look up at the sky, you will see satellites go whizzing by. Um, and they you can tell it's a satellite and not a plane. A plane has two navigation lights, a red one and a green one. 
Um, and anything that is going at a good clip that doesn't have those is so far away that you can't see the red and green navigation lights and is going so fast that no plane could possibly be able to do that at the height required for you to not be able to see its navigation lights anymore. And if you lie back and watch, about once every five minutes or so, you will see something move across the full arc of the sky. Um, and considering that you can see on a clear night a good third of the Earth's um, exposed sky, I mean, maybe that's too much, maybe it's only a fifth or a tenth, doesn't matter. The fact that these things go whizzing by so quickly um, is sort of neat. And one of those things, one of those bright lights, depending on where you are, is this International Space Station with eight or so uh, lunatics in it conducting science experiments while hurtling along at 7,652 meters per second, hovering 431 kilometers above the Earth's surface. All right, so we're going to do a different type of problem um, where instead of fixing the radius, we're going to try fixing the time. Okay, um, so one of the truly wonderful innovations of the 20th century um, was satellite communication. Uh, around the turn of the century, right, the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the British, for example, had uh, their parliament in the UK and they had colonies in places like Australia. And so you had English speaking families on both sides of the planet here and they might want to talk to each other every once in a while. Um, and so in order to do that, you had to lay cable, right, a uh, copper conductor all the way from Australia to the UK, um, which is absurd. And you had to do that because any sort of broadcast that you tried to send through radio, um, you could send it this way or that way or in any direction that was perpendicular or parallel to the surface of the Earth. Same thing here. But you can't send it through the Earth because the Earth is a giant ball of iron which you cannot project um, an electromagnetic field through. So radio can't penetrate the Earth. But if you can see what's happening here with these lines, if you could find some way to bounce a signal so that it came out, struck some sort of plate, and then bounced back, then you would be able to communicate with radio without needing any sort of copper conductors. So how do you accomplish this? Well, you, you put a satellite out there, which at the turn of the 20th century um, was not an option, um, but certainly over the next 50 years, uh, satellites did start to appear with um, Sputnik and uh, its uh, predecessors, successors, successors, <laughs> the ones that came after. Um, so I want to put a satellite up there, but the trick about this this uh, reflector is I have to know where it is. So if it is constantly twirling around my planet, and I don't know where it is, I don't know where to aim the signals. Further to that, if it's not in precisely this location, when I send that signal out and it moves, by the time the signal reaches there, it will be reflected to not my friend in Australia. So in order for this communication satellite network to work, I need this satellite to hang precisely above the same place on Earth at all times. So it needs to be directly over top of this spot, wherever that is. So the orbit of this satellite has to match the turn of the Earth. Because right? <laughs> further complicating this, not only does your satellite have to stay uh, still relative to the planet, um, the planet is itself in motion. So a, a satellite that's doing this um, that has an orbit that is synchronous with the rotation of the Earth is called geosynchronous. So a geosynchronous orbit has an orbital period, that's the big T, it's the time it takes for one orbit, that equals exactly 24 hours. Well, it's not exactly 24 hours, it's whatever the Earth's rotation is, which is 
24 hours. So if I were to take that number and I were to scale it up into minutes, I'd have to multiply that by 60 and then I'd have to multiply it by 60 again to get seconds. So let's see, 24 times 60 gives me 1,440 minutes times 60 gives me 86,400 seconds. So if I could fix that orbital period, then I would have a satellite that stayed in the same place relative to the Earth. It is of course moving in a circle, but the circle that it's traveling on happens to line up with the way that the Earth is turning. All right, so if I can do that, then I have a time that I can plug into Kepler's laws. And I just have to work out the radius necessary in order for this thing to work. So Kepler's laws were g m over 4 pi squared is the radius cubed divided by the time squared. I have the time, so I'm going to pop it up over here. So r cubed will be g is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Time squared would go here, that's 86,400 squared divided by 4 pi squared. All right, so let's get r cubed. Eighty six thousand four hundred squared gives me seven point four times ten to the something times five point nine eight that's ten to the twenty four multiplied by six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven is something times ten to the twenty four divide by four divide by pi divide by pi again because it's squared gives me seven point five four two times 10 to the 24. Ooh, 22. Okay. Now that is r cubed, so I have to cube root this. Be careful you don't square root it. It is a cube root. So if I raise that to the exponent one third, I get 4.23 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. So in terms of kilometers, I would need this to be 10 to the, th I'm going to snag 10 to the 3 for this to make it kilometers. So that would leave me 10 to the 4 left. So that would be 4. Two, three, four, four kilometers. Ten to the three, ten to the four, ten to the five, ten to the six, ten to the seven. Yep, there we go. Now, our International Space Station was orbiting at uh, 431, uh, 431 kilometers above the surface, so it was uh, six point. What would we have? 6.811 times 10 to the 6 meters, uh, which is 681. Grab 3. 10 to 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. There we go. So the International Space Station is at about 7,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. This orbit, the geosynchronous one, is 42,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth. So this thing is six times higher than the International Space Station is. And if you put something there, then it just hovers over a, per a particular location on the Earth's surface. So that's the basics of Kepler's law. There's only two things you can solve. You can either be given a time, solve for the radius, or you can be given a radius and asked to solve for the time. So the, uh, the practice questions ask you to do a little bit of this work 
um, for Mars. Um, so I will leave you to try those.